Would you ever cheat to win? Are you so competitive that you will do anything to gain an advantage? Or do you believe that good sportsmanship should always come first? Well, cheats never prosper as the old saying goes, but there seems to be a great deal of sportsmanship in bowling, more so than in many other sports. There are a number of unwritten rules about how one should conduct themselves, and a lot of things are considered unsportsmanlike. For example, let's say that during a tournament you throw a shot but leave a nine, however it gets counted as a strike but nobody realises and play carries on as normal. Well, perhaps one person might spot it and calls the tournament official over, who rules that the strike will count. Now, it would be heavily frowned upon for you to not admit that it was not a strike if you knew that this was the case. But what if we compared this to soccer? If the referee awards a penalty and the player knowingly dived, the player in question would not even consider admitting that he had dived and therefore it should not be a penalty. So I think bowling is very much a gentleman's game and sportsmanship is prominent and expected by other bowlers. This raises a question, however, regarding cheating. Sport is all about gaining an advantage. And as long as you are within the rules of the game, many would argue that doing all you can to beat your opponents is just a smart move. So as long as you stay within the rules, you're fine, right? Well, not quite, because many bowlers out there would consider many tactics used to gain an advantage as quote-unquote cheating. So in this video, we're going to explore this in more detail and look at some specific examples. But let's start with the famous feud between Jason Belmonte and Sean Rash. Many of you will know the story by now, but let's just do a quick recap. It all started in 2011 at the PBA team shootout. Rash seemed to be distracted while on his approach and after throwing a strike, he had a bit of a meltdown and had some pretty choice words for his opponent, Jason Belmonte. Rash believed that Belmo was purposefully making noises with a water bottle in an attempt to distract both himself and other players. Rash stated that he was tired of it and also said that everyone you do it to. This implies that there has been other incidents like this one in previous tournaments and clearly Belmo had a bit of a reputation among the players. And we actually saw a second similar incident again in 2011 at the PBA Dick Webber playoffs involving Belmonte and Brad Angelo. Now I believe this actually took place a couple of months prior to the Sean Rash outburst which does add some weight to the accusations Sean was making at the time. Once again, it appeared that there were noises being made by Belmo's water bottle, which seemed to distract Angelo. And Angelo called Belmo out for continuing to play with the water bottle throughout the match, each time while Angelo was on his approach. Now, I'm not trying to accuse Belmonte in any way, because we will never know whether this was intentional or not. It doesn't help that there were two instances where this happened, and clearly Rash and Angelo both seemed convinced that this was a regular tactic that Belmonte was using. However, I still think we have to give him the benefit of the doubt. But let's just say that this was an intentional move. While many would say that this was extremely unprofessional and out of bounds because he was deliberately trying to distract a player. I know it's only the sound of a water bottle, but remember that when a player is on TV, there is complete silence. So it doesn't take much at all to break somebody's concentration. It's easy for us to judge and say that the pros should be able to block these things out. But that's easy to say as an observer watching from the couch. But straight away, I think we're starting to draw the line between what's acceptable and what's unsportsmanlike. And it seems like water bottles would fall on the unacceptable side. So let's just go over the background for this video. This idea for the video came about from a comment on one of my other videos regarding urethane and how bowlers will purposefully use urethane to try and push oil down so that it ultimately affects other players uh, and the line that they want to use. And this kind of got me thinking whether this class is as a form of cheating. Because technically there's nothing that I could think of in the rules to say a bowler well, can't use urethane and of course no bowler would admit that they're purposely trying to use urethane to affect other bowlers. But I'm sure there are many of you out there who might consider this as a form of cheating in the sense that it goes against the spirit of the game in a way. 
and it raises the question of whether you should just focus on your own game. Should you not be going out there and trying to beat the competition through your ability rather than having to resort to tactics like the urethane example? The conclusion I came to was that this is just part of the game and I think it's something that's just accepted amongst the pros, probably because they're just so used to tactics like this. But what about a slightly different example? Anthony Simonson can throw a very good two-handed backup ball, so essentially he becomes a left-hander as he's using a backup shot. We have actually seen him use this shot in a tournament before, so let's look at an extreme example and say what if he made a tv show with four other left-handers would it be out of bounds for him to throw a backup urethane ball in practice in an attempt to affect the other left-handers obviously with four lefties that alone is going to create a lot of transition for them anyway but someone like simonson could try and create more problems for them by spraying a urethane around on the left-hand side of the lane and again this raises the question is this a form of cheating or is it just a clever way to gain an advantage? In the eyes of many, it definitely wouldn't be a good look and I'm sure Simonson would get a lot of hate for doing something like this. Now before we move on, I'd just like to ask a small favour. As I've mentioned in pretty much every video so far, this is still a pretty brand new bowling channel. I'm trying to grow this channel as much as I can so I can reach as many bowling fans as possible. So if you've enjoyed this video so far, I'd really appreciate it if you could go ahead and click the subscribe button below. Now, would you go further than this uh, urethane example to gain an advantage? Let's look at some more examples where bowlers try to gain an edge over their opponents. These examples are mainly applicable to head-to-head matchups and focus quite a lot on the mental game and trying to get inside your opponent's head. Many pros are unfazed by a lot of these tactics simply because they've seen it all before but a lot of less experienced bowlers may certainly be affected by these sort of mind games. We spoke about Angelo earlier and his accusation that Belmonte was deliberately trying to put players off by making noises with his water bottle. But there was an extremely interesting match against Chris Barnes and Brad Angelo where things got quite heated. It was during the 2010 Marathon Open and about halfway through the match, Angelo missed the pocket and threw a Brooklyn strike. Angelo then threw his hands up almost in mock celebration. Now you could see from Barnes' face that he was not amused. And a frame later, Barnes was doing a mid-game interview with Rob and Randy. And he made a comment about his last shot saying, at least it didn't go Brooklyn. This fired Angelo up instantly. And when he threw his next strike, he yelled over to Barnes, that ain't no Brooklyn, that ain't no Brooklyn there and made the same comment when he threw another strike. Now Barnes was clearly trying to play some mind games with Brad, but it actually completely backfired on Barnes. It lit a huge fire under Angelo, who went on to defeat Barnes to move on to the next match where he faced Pete Webber. This is a great example of how these sort of tactics can go wrong, and sometimes it's better to focus on your own game rather than trying to affect your opponents. Another mental game tactic the bowlers will try to employ is slow playing. Slow playing can come in a few different forms. For instance, when a player balks. For those of you unfamiliar with the term balking, to balk on a shot refers to when a player goes to throw his shot but stops before they release the ball and then they reset and throw the shot again. Now, I actually read somewhere that apparently guys like Sean Rash and Chris Barnes used to balk on purpose as a means to try and put their opponent off. I'm not quite sure why this might put somebody off, apart from the fact that it might break their rhythm as it does slow the game down when players are balking multiple times. The PBA addressed the issue of slow playing a long, long time ago as they implemented a shot clock so that any player who exceeded the shot clock would be fined. Now, I don't think this had anything to do with the PBA uh, trying to protect the rules or the integrity of the game, but it was really just about TV time constraints. They can't be running over time-wise, so players simply have to be bowling at a certain pace. Slow playing is an interesting topic for me because I've seen this used in head-to-head -head matches many, many times. One thing you may have noticed is that when a player is bowling well and they start to string strikes together, they start to speed up. 
Not all players do this, but many do. It's amazing to watch sometimes because someone will get a, a three or four in a row and then suddenly they're literally running up to the approach when it's their turn, desperate to throw their shot. You actually often see this um, in young children and teenagers especially as well. Um, so what a number of experienced match play bowlers do is they try and slow the game right down during instances like this. It's an attempt to break the other bowler's rhythm. They notice that they're speeding up and they're getting into a, a bit of a zone um, and so they start to take more time on their next shot. Now this is something that is actually against the rules because in most tournaments slow play is completely against the rules there isn't a shot clock as such but if the tournament official deems that you are taking more than a reasonable amount of time they will pull you up on it it's a little bit like in poker when a player calls the clock um, there's not necessarily a set amount of time a player has to make his decision but if they are taking an extremely long time somebody will call the clock and then they will normally have one minute to make their decision. This is why shot clocks are more and more common in poker tournaments now, because so many players were taking ridiculous amounts of time to make decisions. I think a similar problem started to arise in bowling, which is why these slow play rules were introduced to um, not only you know, PBA tournaments, but the majority of other tournaments, even in the amateur circuit. But dictating the pace of a head-to-head -head match isn't all about slowing it down. I've also seen many instances of players speeding up play during strategic points in the match. This certainly isn't something that is against the rules, but once again, it starts to err on the side of poor sportsmanship for many. Many of the tournaments that I used to play that had a head-to-head -head, um, knockout match would not use the standard match format that we see on TV. Now, this is where a player uh, let's say player one will throw their first frame, then player two will bowl frames one and two, then it's back to player one to bowl frames two and three, and then they continue bowling two frames each in this manner. But most of the tournaments would not have this structure, and players would just bowl one frame at a time. So what some players might do is bowl their frame, and then quickly jump ahead of their opponent to bowl their next frame before they, they had the opportunity. Now the idea of this is once again, you're trying to break your opponent's rhythm, but also to try and add further pressure. Let's say player A is working on a double and wanted to try and add even more pressure, they would cut ahead to bowl their next frame before their opponent, even though technically it would be the opponent's turn to bowl their frame based on this principle of bowling one frame at a time. They were able to get away with this because there was no set structure for how the frame should be bowled in a head-to-head -head match. So as you can see, these sorts of tactics are designed to try and not only gain an edge, but to try and put your opponents off their game too. I think a lot of this really does come down to your own belief systems and how you want to play the game from, I guess, a moral standpoint. Because let's take someone like Michael Jordan or the late Kobe Bryant, their desire to win cannot really be expressed. They were just built differently and would do everything in their power to win. If you followed the NBA, you'll know just how much Michael would trash talk other players and do anything to get in their heads. But if you were to try and adhere to the similar sportsmanship type of conduct that we've come to expect in bowling, then perhaps even something like trash talk would be something that would be a no-no in many people's eyes. Another problem is you run the risk of becoming very unpopular, not only amongst fans, but other bowlers too. And on top of this, as we saw in the example of Chris Barnes trash talking Brad Angelo, it can easily backfire and cause the other player to improve their game, as it can often light a fire under some players when challenged in this way. Now, I'm probably one of the most competitive people in the world. It doesn't matter what it is. I want to not only win, but perform to a high standard too. So my opinion on this used to be that as long as you're in line with the rules of the game, then really anything does go when it comes to trying to gain an edge on your opponent. And I always just believed that um, these little mental tactics were just part of the game. I had them used on me by many bowlers, so in turn, I used them on other bowlers as well. It was just how it was. But in recent years, I've changed my opinion slightly just because um, I feel like it's best to just focus on your own game. So it's that mindset of, I'm not going to worry about what my opponent is doing. 
I don't want to even engage in these kind of mental battles because simply you want to block everything out and try to perform the best that you can. So when it comes to the example of using urethane to try and affect other players' shots, this is not something that I would ever do, but only because I feel like I want to be able to beat other people because I perform better. You want to deserve a victory. I personally wouldn't want to have to say, well, the only reason I won is because I was able to put everyone else off. So why these sort of tactics are pretty prominent in the game? I think it's far more beneficial to just focus on yourself and what you can control. But this is why it's such an interesting subject because everyone will have a different opinion on this. But ultimately, I think it comes down to the old saying, win with grace and lose with grace. And when you're competing, it's down to you to not only stick to the rules of the game, but also to decide what you think is fair and how you feel that you should conduct yourself. So I'm going to open this up to all of you and please do comment below. I'd like to know how far you would go to gain an advantage against your opponents. What sort of things do you consider to be out of bounds? And of course, please do let me know your opinions on the Jason Belmonte cheating um, accusations, should we say. So yeah, please do comment below. Thank you very much for listening and watching to today's video. If you've enjoyed it, please do consider subscribing. And thank you once again, Bowling fans, and see you all next time.